Now I would like to introduce our first panel and our first speaker. Aidan Hart was born in England in 1957 and grew up in New Zealand. He returned to live in England and spent a couple of years in formation at Mount Athos and studying to become a monk, but uh, then became a member of the Orthodox Church, a married man, and started, really launched his career in iconography. His intense prayer life has had a profound effect on his work, and any of you who have had a chance to speak with him in the few days he's been here in Princeton, I think you can, you, you can feel that in his presence. Aiden works in a wide variety of media, egg tempera, fresco, mosaic, stone and wood carving, illuminated manuscript painting, church furnishings, and he's told me he's also recently gotten really interested in church architecture, everything from lighting and acoustics and design. He has more than 1,300 commissioned works in 25 countries of the world. If you want to see some of his work, I just encourage you to tune in on May 6th to the coronation of, the, of King Charles of England, and you will see some of his work. Um, you should definitely check out his website, Aiden, AidenHartIcons.com. It is full of beautiful images and an incredible amount of his writings. He has taken many of his writings and published them into three books, which we have for sale here. Techniques of Icon and Wall Painting. It is the Bible of Icon Painting, if I may say so. Festal Icons, History and Meaning, which I am using to teach here in a class on the Virgin Mary. And Beauty, Spirit and Matter, a collection of essays that I think express the heart of Aidan's conviction that iconographic art is really about restoring the dignity of the human person. So now we, I am pleasure, it's my pleasure to welcome Aidan. After we have Aidan's talk, we will have a conversation between Aidan and one of his former students, David Clayton, who is now the provost at Pontifex University, which offers an online degree in sacred arts. Um, we will also have Paul Coyer, who is a senior fellow at the Common Sense Society, an organization promoting beauty and virtue. Aidan, thank you. Thank you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. <coughs> Our subject this morning, as you know, is liturgical art as prophecy and art in the restoration of human dignity. I've chosen this title because I believe that we act as we see. And worship and its art can profoundly affect the way we see the world and see one another and also the material world, the way we see a tree and a stone. Our relationship with others and with the world at large corresponds to our vision of who we think we are and who we think others are. Do I think that those people around me, my neighbors, are my competitors, are my enemies perhaps? Do I see them as a means of my individual happiness? Do I consider them merely as members of a crowd walking down the street? Or do I see all those around me, those to the left and to the right of us, the person we see walking on the street, the crying baby, as living icons of God, potential saints, amazing and unique beings, small gods, sons and daughters of the Most High? Behind destructive actions, our footprints, which if followed back, will always lead to their source, which is normally a false vision and ignorance, perhaps a caricature of the person whom they're mistreating. False worldviews, therefore, need to be replaced with true ones. I believe that the holy liturgy and its sacred arts, when healthy, can transform the way we see the world. Someone has named this discovering new holy images to live by, uh, the, the art of iconopia, the making of images. In fact, it's more the discovery rather than the making of images. So, if you want change, we must first change the way we see. More particularly, if we want to flourish in culture, and of course this is what SCAR is about, and many of the people I've spoken with, 
uh, Pete's just a few minutes ago. If you want a flourishing culture, a flourishing education, we need to transform the way we see the world. We must begin, if you want a rich culture, with the cult, which means worship. Culture comes from worship. We need to look to our worship. Is our worship the worship of our parish church? Is that how it ought to be? Is it a reflection of divine worship or hotchpots made by humans? What we offer to God within the walls of our church community is what we will live out beyond the walls of that church. The prophet Ezekiel had a vision of a temple, and in this vision, a river, actually quite a small river in the beginning, flowed from underneath the threshold. I encourage you to read this account. And wherever the river flowed, it brought life. Whatever a culture worships will, like a river, either spread life or if it is polluted water, if their worship is a false one, it will spread death. Relationships and whole cultures fail because they do not realize the unmanageable dignity and high calling of the human person. A saint acts with great love and reverence towards all God's creatures because he or she sees all others as sons and daughters of the King of Glory. Each person is created as a prince and princess of the Most High, destined, if they wish it, to become partakers of the divine nature, to use the Apostle Peter's words. So these two saints, most of the images I'll show you of icons or liturgical art I've made, this is St. Matthew and St. Cuthbert. We think of saints as sort of supernatural, exceptional beings, but they are the normal humans. The saint is the normal person. And I've had the blessing of knowing three living saints in my time, St. Saint Paisius, St. Saint Porphyrius, and St. Sophroni. If we regard the people sitting next to us as true living icons of God, we will treat them with profound respect. The importance of getting this vision right is one reason why the art of worship is so important. If the liturgical art of our microcosm does not accord with God's intention for all life, then life beyond the church walls, the macrocosm, will be disoriented. As the prophet says, without vision, the people perish. Worship on earth, we get now to the specifics of worship. Worship on earth is an icon of and participation in the worship of heaven. This is an icon called the protecting veil. And you notice in the upper half, the mother of God and saints with halos. Down below is the community worshipping. But it's one icon and one reality. Those worshipping on earth are participating in worship in heaven. So everything about liturgical art is to reflect heavenly worship. It's not ultimately the creation of man. We'll go into this in more detail. As the Our Father prayer says, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Since our idea of heaven, of the ideal if you like, is the ideal to which we strive in all, all our daily lives, we had better get our worship right or we're in trouble. We're seeking utopia which doesn't exist. Some scholars have, for example, Philip Sherard is one and there are many others, who have traced our current ecological crisis back to a faulty theology and a faulty theology of matter to an iconoclastic form of worship that doesn't include matter. A worship that denies the capacity of the material world to express God's love for us and our love for God will inevitably affect how those worshippers treat the material world outside. Beauty, worship, and truth are close cousins, I believe. In Greek, the word for dogma is the same as worship and glory, voxa. So dogma, worship, and glory are the same word. So this morning, I'd like us to explore in a little more detail what is this great dignity and calling of the human person, what it consists of, through considering two sources of the church's wisdom, the written and the visual tradition of the church. We'll consider two uh, sources in particular, the writings of a great Saint Irenaeus of Lyon, a second century saint, 
and then the visual witness of the Orthodox Church's liturgical art. I like to speak of things I know rather than know of in theory. And I, I know a lot of my commissions are for Catholic and Anglican churches. It's within the Orthodox tradition, so I'll concentrate on, on that. So we should consider, first of all, who we are, then what this means, and finally, how we can express this calling through the ministries of prophet and priest. So first of all, who are we? What does St. Irenaeus of Lyon say about this? Um, you can see how early he lived. Um, in fact, he'd heard Polycarp preach. He was a contemporary Polycarp, who himself was a disciple of St. John. So here we have a man really close to the time of the apostles, so we can be sure that what he says comes out of the living tradition. This icon is painted by one of my um, students, uh, Lee Harvey. So he's really close to the time of Christ, but also he was a man who in himself, as it were, encompassed the Mediterranean world. He was born in Smyrna in present-day Turkey, but ended up being a priest and then a bishop in South France, Lyon. So what does he have to tell us about the nature of the human person. Irenaeus affirmed that all people are icons of God, regardless of the right or wrong use of their free will. But he also asserted that when God created us in his image, he created us with a task, which is to grow into the divine likeness of God through a synergy of our free will and God's grace. Adam and Eve, as it were, had a task set before them. They were pure, but not perfect. To be deified and transfigured, to be a partaker of the Holy Spirit, a spirit bearer, a Christophorus, a Christ bearer, is therefore mankind's natural, supernatural calling, which is why a saint is a full human, but not merely human, but they are divine by grace, not by nature. They are God-bearer by grace. They are partaker of the divine nature, as the Apostle Peter says. So our task is nothing less than to become gods by grace, as Irenaeus wrote in his work Against Heresies. I'll, I'll just uh, quote a little bit from the part, first part of that. Man has first come into being and then to progress, and by progressing come to manhood, and having reached manhood, to increase. And thus increasing to persevere, and by persevering, be glorified, and thus to see his Lord. For it is God's intention that, we, that God should be seen by us. And the vision of God is the acquisition of immortality. And immortality brings the human person near to God. And elsewhere he wrote even more succinctly, Our Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God, of his boundless love, became what we are, that he might make us what he himself is. In what way, then, is a human person made in God's image and likeness? A Gnostic teaching at the time of St. Irenaeus asserted that the material world and man's body was the result of the fall. Get matter out of the way, and you'll float to God. This, of course, was a heresy, but it was quite current then. Irenaeus countered this by asserting that the human person is in God's image as a union of body, soul, and spirit. The whole person, including the body, is in the image of God, he asserted, not just a part of him or her. While some church fathers do say that the divine image in us is located in the spirit, Irenaeus, I think, uh, expresses the Christian tradition more fully by saying that it's the union of the whole person that is in the divine image. He writes, soul and spirit can be constituents of man, but they certainly are not the whole man. The complete man, the complete person, is a mixture and union consisting of a soul which takes to itself the spirit of the Father, to which is united the flesh which was fashioned in the image of God. Men are spiritual, not by the abolition of flesh. They would then be the spirit of man or the spirit of God, but not a spiritual man. But when the spirit is mingled with soul and united with created matter, then through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the complete person is produced. This is a man made in the image of likeness of God who's progressed from being merely an image 
also to God's likeness. He goes on after this quote to say, a person with soul only, lacking spirit, a psychic, just a soul, psyche, psychic comes from the Greek soul, such a man is carnal, unfinished, incomplete. There might be a university professor, but if they don't love God, they're just on this middle realm, the psychic realm, the soulless realm. This soulish man has in his created body the image of God, but he has not acquired the likeness to God through the Holy Spirit. So these are quite complicated things, but in fact it's quite simple. But I'll, I'll just outline three things that struck me. Firstly, the key passage in the quote we've just read is, through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the complete man is produced. Man's deified state, granted through mutual love and the gift of the Holy Spirit, is man's calling and his fulfillment. This is why we date a lot of the church year from Pentecost. That's our birth. Pentecost is the beginning of full humanity. To be a complete human is to become more than merely human. It is to become a bearer of the Holy Spirit, a Pentecostal. To be deified, to become gods by grace. So contrary to the humanist motto, God, not man, is the measure of all things. So the human person becomes the true self when he looks away from himself, forgetful of himself, as Irenaeus says, to, comp to contemplate his divine prototype, who is Christ. Elsewhere, Irenaeus writes, where the spirit of the Father is, there is the living man, flesh possessed by the spirit, forgetful of itself, assuming the quality of the spirit made conformable to the word of God. Secondly, if Irenaeus were to highlight any particular aspect of the human person that makes him capable of such a high calling, it would be their freedom. Freedom either to love God and worship him, or tragically to worship something else. Without freedom, there can't be love. I don't know how many of you have read Dostoevsky, but this is a major theme for Dostoevsky, the tragedy and the wonder of human freedom. Irenaeus writes that to be glorified, man must persevere, and by persevering be glorified, and thus there is Lord, and perseverance assumes free will. At any point I can say, right, it's too hard, I'm going to go down the mountain, and we don't see the Lord transfigured. We've got the freedom to follow Christ up to table, or to turn around and go back to our previous life. Thirdly, Irenaeus asserts that man's materiality is an integral part of his destiny to grow into the divine likeness. He states that the complete man is a mixture and union of body, soul, and spirit. He even goes further, and this was new to me when I was reading his works in preparation for today. He goes on to write that the flesh is fashioned in the image of God. It's a pretty scandalous thing to say. How can flesh be in God's image? For God is bodiless, beyond imitation or measure. I, th I think this is my own understanding of this. I could be wrong. I think the two reasons that he can say we are made, our flesh, our body is made in God's image. First of all, some of the church fathers say that even if there hadn't been a fall, God would still have become flesh. There wouldn't have been a crucifixion, but he would have become flesh. So we're made in God's image as bodily beings looking forward to the incarnation, looking forward to the logos taking on our humanity. So Christ, the incarnate Logos, is actually the prototype of all us humans. The one crucial difference, of course, is that Christ is God by nature and human by grace, while the deified man or woman is human by nature and divine by grace. Second, we can say that the human body is made in God's image because its physical faculties, for example, sight, hearing, and touch, all correspond to a higher and incorporeal reality in God. So God sees us, God hears us, God touches us by his Holy Spirit. So divine seeing precedes human seeing. So our faculties are just a dim participation in the uncreated senses of God, to use a crude term. So all that we've said means that... Um, the saints, transfigured and deified humans, are God's intended norm 
for human existence and not the exception. Every person is born a prince or princess, and if they progress in virtues, they will eventually reach the coronation and be anointed as gods by adoption. They'll become kings and queens, co-heirs with Christ to rule in the Holy Spirit. So I think we just need to pause and try to digest how awesome this is, how splendid and magnificent are the faculties that God has given to us, what calling we have before us. Perhaps we sin not so much because we think too highly of ourselves, but because we don't think highly enough of ourselves, because we're ignorant of just how exalted God has called us to be, not because of our virtue, but it's a gift. Surely if I consider the person sitting next to me as an embodied angel, as it were, as, as a, a princess, I'm going to treat them completely different. I find this difficult sometimes. My daughter is, she's a teenager, but let's say no more. <laughs> But I, the real Libby is just beautiful. My lovely son, Alvin, he's a wonderful person. Sometimes, uh, yeah, I know what I was like when I was a teenager. He just drive the parents mad. One of the gifts of a good parent, but, and I'm not a good parent, if I were a good parent, I would keep reminding myself, you know, the real Libby, the real Alvin is there. <coughs> the very fact that some people misuse these faculties, particularly of human freedom, to wreak destruction on others is itself testament to the powers that God has granted to mankind, whether to use or abuse, according to each person's free will. Beholding the human person with the eyes of the Holy Spirit, we can declare, like Shakespeare, like Hamlet, rather, in Shakespeare, what a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in form and moving, how express and admirable in action, how like an angel in apprehension, how like a god. So all the woes of this world come, I believe, from failing to grasp the true greatness and destiny of the human person, both for ourselves and for all others. Because every fiber of the human person is created for this estate, if we refuse it, or perhaps find it too good to believe, we will still crave fulfillment, we'll still be hungry, thirsty beings. And if we don't believe God exists or God can fill that thirst, we'll look to fulfill our thirst and hunger elsewhere in lesser things. And it's from this that come wars, factions, crimes, unkindness, consumerism, selfishness, ugliness, brutalism. In short, all the woes of the world come from people looking, thirsting, but not finding it in Christ. But if we believe in and embrace this high dignity and calling given to us by the beneficent God, we will live with thanksgiving, and gratitude to our maker. We'll become rich overnight. We will show profound respect for all other human beings as living icons of God. We will honor all creation as expressions of God's love for us. When I was frescoing a church, and I'll show you images later, uh, in Greece, um, this was for a man called Philip Sherard who'd written a lot about uh, ecology from a Christian point of view. And we had standing saints and then a tree, a standing saint and tree, and each tree was different. So I'd take a branch from outside and paint this tree, but not just as a photographic representation, but as a tree aflame with God's grace. So I was painting in an iconographic way. I might be there for eight hours. It's a fresco, and you've got to work nonstop with fresco until the plaster dries. So I was painting this olive tree, let's say, as a burning bush. And I went outside, and I saw the olive tree in a different way afterwards. As we'll see, this is one of the profound roles of liturgical art, to see the world and people not just as bushes, as stones, but as things aflame with God's grace. So thus are made cultures that are worshipping communities, cultures worthy of that word, for as I said, the word cult means to worship. So we've looked at the image of the written word. Let's look at the witness of the liturgy. We come now to the witness of traditional work, uh, worship. Uh, I'm a member of the Orthodox Church, so I shall concentrate on its particular form of liturgical worship. Each, um, each of you come from perhaps different traditions. You'd have to apply this in your own way. So this is a very rich theme of Orthodox liturgical worship, so I just want to draw out three elements. This on the right is the church parish I go to. The church building is actually founded in the 8th century. The building we see there is about 13th century, um, you can't see it very well, but there are frescoes there that are from 
the 1380, roughly. Um, I frescoed the end there, Christ and Glory, and some roundels, and made the whole icon screen and the icons there. So first of all, community and trinity. To, me, to be made in God's image means that we're made in the image of the Holy Trinity. So God is a communion of three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So human life, as God intended it to be, and as worship is intended to be, is therefore communal. We are made in God's image not primarily as isolated individuals, but as members of a community. This is one reason why the walls um, of an Orthodox church ideally is covered in frescoes or mosaics. So when we enter the church to worship, we're not actually beginning a service. We're joining in the ceaseless worship of heaven. I was a hermit for six years. Bit of advice. If you want a quiet life, don't be a hermit. <laughs> if you hear there's a hermit up in the mountain, what do you ever do? Just come visit him. So if you want a quiet life, don't be a hermit. But I, I converted a barn into a chapel. And being a hermit, most of the time when there weren't visitors, which wasn't very often, but when I was alone, I would start the morning prayers, but I wasn't starting them. With all the frescoes around me, and I'll show you photographs, I knew. I was just joining in for two or three or four hours to the timeless worship. So this worshipping community on earth is actually part of the worshipping community in heaven. So Irenaeus is no longer a person of the past for me, sundered from me by the scissors of death, but he's a living being gathered with me around the throne of God. So community and trinity. The second aspect of liturgical art and worship is mystery, matter and mystery. So traditional worship uses matter crafted by human hands to express the mystery of God dwelling among his people. So here we have um, icons, we have a, a brass lamp, we have beeswax candles, Matter, things, things, glorious things. So this is a whole orchestra of crafted works united in a single symphony of praise to God and also God's revelation to us. So here, human mastery of the cosmos is used not to dominate it, but to transfigure it, to make it more articulate in the praise and worship of God. So there's no longer a division between me and nature, as it's fallaciously called. The church fathers see the created world, the cosmos, as an extension of our bodies. One being necessary for the other. So our ecological crisis began not with technology, false technology or misuse of technology, but it began in the heart of the human person. When he separated himself from the rest of creation, calling the latter nature, and I'm a human, that's nature, I can do what I want with this object called nature. Summarizing a wonderful small book by an Indian um, uh, from India, not, not American Indian, Paulus Margagorius, called The Human Presence, I thoroughly recommend it. The, the essence of this book um, is quoted, is, is summarized by John Catuno. He says, mastery of nature for oneself is the Adamic sin of refusing our mediating position between God and the rest of the world. The mastery of nature must be held within the mystery of worship. Otherwise, we lose both mastery and mystery. We make of nature as our extended body into the hands of the loving God a Eucharistic self-offering. I'll discuss this later, but when I'm, and Jonathan will talk about this, when he's carving an icon, when I'm painting an icon, when I'm doing silver work, I'm, I'm gathering these little elements from creation, but in fact, this little work I'm doing, I'm offering the whole of creation in a more articulate praise to God. Thirdly, revelation and creativity. All human creativity is inevitably involved in the fashioning an enactment of liturgy. We heard singing yesterday. So human beings sing. Um, so there's obviously human creativity and a human element in this. But on the other hand, authentic liturgy comes from revelation, not from human invention. We see this union of revelation and originality in Scripture. The Hebrew, the Hebrew cycle of feasts and fasts 
the scheme for the tent of meeting was all given to Moses by God. Moses didn't think, oh, we need a bit of beauty. Let's I'll sketch a few things and we'll make the tent of meeting. It was given by God. These are some frescoes I painted for, um, this is the Lancaster University. This is a Catholic chaplaincy, and that's another Catholic parish. So they're both different. They both depict um, a similar thing, transfiguration and um, Christ's appearance, resurrection appearance. Um, and I had to adapt to these particular spaces. So there was human creativity. But um, all the time, I was basing the essence on what was revealed in the scriptures and the tradition of the church about the essence of the transfiguration or Christ's appearance to the Marys. So artistic creativity is therefore a fruit and not the origin of liturgy, which comes from revelation. So variety, the variety within liturgical art, comes from different people, different cultures, different individuals expressing timeless truths in their particular locality. So a society, I believe, will flourish as much as it has and then is guided by a rich liturgical life. That rich liturgical life keeps before it that our, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we don't know what heaven is like, we're lost. We don't know what we're aspiring towards. I stayed for a while... Um, on the Greek islands of Sifnos, and then later in Evia, where I painted this fresco. It took about six weeks. Then later on, as Margarita mentioned, I lived on Mount Athos. And there, I was profoundly uh, impressed by the way that um, there was an overflow from the liturgy, the worship, into daily life. Um, you would see the way that people fasted or feasted uh, in Greece. It was all affected it all affected what you saw in the, in the shops. Um, processions outside with the icons so that the church has got walls, but then, on the other hand, it, it doesn't say everything outside the church walls are profane. You'll see, if you go to um, Greece, you'll get a taxi driver, you get a taxi perhaps, and there'll be an icon there. Uh, you need it with some of the Greek taxi drivers. <laughs> there was um, uh, a bishop who died and, and went to heaven and a taxi driver who died who went to heaven. And um, Peter welcomed them both, and he escorted... Um, the taxi driver to this incredible, incredible mansion. And then he goes back for Peter and uh, the bishop rather and shows uh, the bishop a bit of a shack, really. And, and the bishop says, um, I think you've got us mixed up. No, no, says Peter. No, I'm afraid not. He said, well, how come? Well, this taxi driver here in Greece, he made a lot of people pray really hard. <laughs> <laughs> So what does it mean to be in God's image and, and likeness? So we've examined how St. Irenaeus in summary now shows us that all people are made in God's image, but also they're given a task. We have seen how this entails the whole person, body, soul, and spirit. And we've seen how these principles applied in worship mean that man is made to be communal, that the whole of the cosmos is inextricably tied up with our, us as a Eucharistic animal. I'll show you a quote later, um, which says that the whole creation needs us to be fully articulate in the praise of God. And we've discussed how worship is participation in heavenly worship. So I want to zoom in a bit more uh, to consider what this means for liturgical art and explore some ways how this can be lived out in our daily lives. And I've chosen to discuss this in the terms of the ministry of prophet and priest. So let's start with man as prophet. My Bishop Callistos, my Bishop, Bishop Callistos Ware, who sadly died recently, a saintly man, once said that one is prophet, that's Christ. Some are prophets, such as Moses or Elijah, John the Baptist. And all are prophets, since every Christian is called to discern God's voice in their daily lives. So an integral part of our progress towards union with God is to discern his voice in every situation, every place, every stone, every tree. We're all called to be prophets. To, we tend to think of prophets, don't we, as one who declares the word of the Lord. But in fact, a prophet is one above all who listens. Another term for prophet is seer. So a prophet probably might prophesy only five hours in his whole life, but he'll be listening for thousands and thousands of hours. So a prophet is above all one who listens and only then speaks. The ascetic tradition of both the Eastern and the Western churches identifies 
three stages of spiritual growth. And the middle one is prophetical, I would suggest. So the first stage is purification. Um, in the Greek church, we call it uh, practical theology, practical theology the, the doing. This is uh, making an effort to repent of our sins by God's grace. The second stage is illumination, or natural theology, perceiving God um, in the created world. And the final is union, or mystical theology, which is to meet God face to face, to be united. So purification opens, the first stage, purification, opens the spiritual ear of the seeker to hear the divine logos, the divine word, speaking through each person and thing. So here we have Moses and the burning bush. The bush had always been there. And I would say the bush had always been burning. It wasn't consumed with fire. So obviously the fire is a different form of fire. It's just that Moses' eyes were opened by the Lord to see that bush as it always was. God didn't just create the bush. He kept that bush in existence, that logos spoken by the word. It says in Hebrews, he upholds all things by the word of his power. So prophets, as I said, are called seers, ones who see. And so this intermediate stage um, of uh, natural theology or illumination can be described as beholding the Lord in all creation, just as Moses did in the burning bush. So the, this leads us to the form or style, if you like, of the liturgical art, as distinct from a subject matter like the crucifixion, whatever the subject matter is. How do we depict the crucifixion? So the way things are painted can help us to see the divine fire in and through them. The music with which psalms or hymns are sung has a profound effect on our soul, quite apart from the words themselves. The music of good will amplify the logoi, the inner meaning of the words, and open up our hearts to the deepest meaning of these words. I think we've all experienced this uh, when we've heard great chant, Gregorian, or whatever. On the other hand, if the music is poor, it will attract attention to itself and away from the words. It becomes opaque. In the icon tradition, um, perspective is used quite a lot to help this initiation, this opening of the eye and the, the ear. So visual arts of worship, as distinct from the sung visual, uh, liturgical arts, can assist our initiation in a similar way as good chant. In the icon tradition, for example, we have lines of perspective often converge on the viewer. We're used perhaps to Renaissance perspective, where the lines converge on a point in the distance. So, um, uh, just an example. See this here? The lines converge forward. The lines of the altar converge here, not in the distance. Some call it inverse um, perspective. Why is that? Because two things, I think. First of all, it opens the icon onto our space. We're participants with St. Cuthbert. St. Cuthbert isn't just a person in the past cut off from the scissors of death. He's with us, and the lines of perspective enter through this space. We might call it sacred liturgical space. It also, this inverse perspective so-called, presents the world from the point of the view of the saint or of Christ, rather than of ourselves. We cease to be, therefore, the center of the universe. It gives the praying viewer the sense that Christ or the saint is contemplating us more than we contemplate them. And over the years of being exposed to icons, we gradually come to see that God is the prime, uh, the prime activator in our lives. Our role is to respond to this. We learn to look and listen first, and then to act and to speak. So the way an icon is painted, quite apart from a subject matter, begins to assist a turning from I to thou. And I think this is the essence of repentance, which means in Greek, metanoios, the Greek, a change of a way of seeing. Nous, metanous, it can be defied, defined as the eye of the heart. So before a change of action comes a change of seeing, as I've often said. So the icon, in a sort of subliminal way, because it's so unlike a photograph, so I think, well, why is it like that? Why is it like that? A bit like Moses, he saw this strange sight, a burning bush, that sort of stopped him in his tracks. So he goes closer. 
I just love the image of the burning bush. These are from St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai, where I was last year uh, leading a group. So the movement from seeing to hearing to action is eloquently described in Moses' encounter with God, described in Exodus chapter 3. So Moses is going about his daily work as a, a goat herd or sheep herd, and then he sees a great sight, the burning bush. The scriptures say he draws near to see why this bush is being burnt, but not burnt up. I think many people have this experience when they first encounter icons or sacred music. They're perplexed by its unusualness. You know, why this icon's painted like this? Or, oh, wow, I've never heard any chant like that before. It's a strange sight initially. So Moses draws near, and then the scriptures say God calls to Moses. Moses, Moses. So the experience of divine beauty rather than just you know, human titillating beauty is that it's not a mere aesthetic feeling but always leads to personal encounter with God. So Moses then replies, here I am, Lord. So a dialogue is open. First an aesthetic experience, a strange beauty. He draws near to, out of curiosity. God speaks to him. He speaks back to God. Moses could have fled just as Mary could have fled when the archangel Gabriel appears to her. And she could have not accepted to bring forth God into the world. But Moses chooses to stay and to respond. When God calls to him, he says, here I am. So liturgical art is always ecclesial in the literal sense of the word. That is the work of the people. It always entails reciprocal work between God and man, a synergy. So God then replies to Moses, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. So liturgical beauty attracts and reveals, but also it veils, it draws lines, it affirms what is inaccessible. It simultaneously says and unsays. It's, it's beautiful and attractive, but also sublime and awesome and fearful sometimes. It's interesting that later on when Moses goes up to Mount Sinai, it says there was a dark cloud and there was thunder and lightning. There was light and there was darkness. The saying and the unsaying, the revealing and the hidden. So for worship and its liturgical beauty to be true, it's not solipsistic. Liturgy is not a private club for intellectual or aesthetic delectation. If it doesn't abound to compassion for people on the street, then we have not worshipped in truth. Because God gave a mission to Moses after this wonderful experience, God speaking to him. He said, oh, that's great. I'll write that down in my diary and, and I'll remember that. God gives him a mission. God says, I've observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their suffering. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So if liturgy doesn't abound to compassion, we haven't really encountered liturgy. So we've looked at um, man as, as prophet. Let's now look at what it is to be human um, as in the priestly ministry given to us. So while the emphasis of the prophetic ministry is to receive, that is to hear and see God, the emphasis, I think, of the priestly ministry is to offer, to give. And so Irenaeus describes it in this way. I'll just start off with the sentence before that, then I'll go on to the quote here. Irenaeus writes, We are bound to make our oblation to God, our offering to God, and thus to show ourselves in all things grateful to him as our creator. We offer to God what is his own, suitably proclaiming the communion and unity of flesh and spirit. He goes again, unity of flesh and spirit. We make then our offering to him, not as if, we stand, not as if he stands in need of anything, but giving thanks to his sovereignty and sanctifying his creation. He takes to himself our good endeavors to the end that he may repay us with his good things. So this thing of offering to God, then God descends, as it were, upon the gift of bread and wine to become the body and blood of Christ when we participate. We offer not bread, I so we offer not grapes and wheat, we fashion them into bread and wine. So the three elements to this passage of St. Irenaeus, which says, with most of his writings, is pregnant with meaning. Offering, thanksgiving, and endeavor. 
We offer not grapes and wheat, as I said, but wine and bread, the fruit of mankind's endeavours, their craft, their art. We saw earlier how Irenaeus wrote of man's journey into ever deeper union with God. But also, I think man has a task to go deeper into creation, not to get lost in creation, but to fashion it into an Edenic garden in praise of its creator. So our priestly interaction with the material world can be described as fashioning a hymn of praise, not using words as a liturgical artist, using matter, but fashioning a hymn of praise with material things. So Leontius of Cyprus, um, a saint of the 6th century, wrote that creation does not venerate God directly by itself, but it is through me that the heavens declare the glory of God. Through me, the moon worships God. Through me, the stars glorify him. Through me, the waters and showers of rain, the dew and all creation venerate God and give him glory. Going back to this, um, this is the raw material of an icon, a wooden board, um, gold. Uh, that's a left, that's a azurite stone, which I grind up to make blue, and egg to bind it. These are God-given raw materials. But I don't just sit and look at these lovely <laughs> raw materials. I compose them into a hymn, which is the icon on, on the left. This is what God's command to Adam and Eve really mean. They were given mastery not to dominate and crush and destroy, but mastery of an artist, mastery of a poet, mastery of a musician who takes individual notes and makes them into something beautiful, as we heard yesterday, and we'll sing together again with a wonderful choir. Um, I work in a variety of media, and I'll just quickly go through some of the things I've made, and I'm very aware that, um, that whatever material, there are two things I've got to do. First of all, to listen to that material. Uh, this is a silver work I made, which was a gift from the arch. Bishop of London to the Patriarch of Russia. Um, that's a silver lamp I made when I was in uh, Mount Athos. And um, that's a, uh, a, a, a lamp holder I made uh, out of brass. But each of these materials has a different logos, a different name, a different character. So before I make anything, I've got to listen and understand and submit myself to that particular um, thing that God has made, um, like there's some pigments, for example, um, which are naturally translucent. And once I've got in my room an illuminated manuscript I did, <clears throat> and there's a bit of green in it that's peeling off. The reason was I tried to make that, it's called tear of it, make that pigment that really is best for translucency. I tried to make it thick, so I kept putting it on. So I leave this um, image there to remind me, always listen to the pigment. Don't make it do something it's not meant to do. And if you're a parent, you'll know that one of your jobs is to discern the gift the character of each of your children and how to respond to that, how to bring their character out. I do mosaic as well. This is some mosaics. If you're in Houston, Texas, go to St. George's Orthodox Church. Um, some people try to make mosaic as though it were a painting, but I really much believe that mosaic is like highly pixelated painting and you've got to work with mosaic in a very different way than a painting. Um, I do stone carving. Um, this is an icon screen in um, Amsterdam. Marble is very different. This is uh, limestone. If you try to put too much de detail in limestone, it doesn't work. This is the fresco in the chapel I mentioned, where I lived as a hermit. Interesting, that whole chapel in materials probably only cost about 200 pounds. So the fresco is made of dirt, basically. Pigment, is, the earth pigment is dirt. And the lime um, that that is painted on, it's real fresco, is just basically burnt um, chalk. All quite simple. And all the wood is recycled. So all the time you're trying to find the best way to use that particular material. Uh, Jonathan was recently at Aveyron. Where are you, Jonathan? Ah, oh, yeah. He visited Aveyron and to, to you know, this wonderful icon of the Port Aitasa, and I was commissioned to carve this casing for it. And this other work here was um, in the same monastery. This is oak, and oak is very different from, say, lime wood or from um, cherry. Each wood has its own logos. Uh, these are two doors I made uh, for the church in um, Madrid. Uh, this is an embroidery I designed to go around the Porta Aetis, so I can you saw a second ago, but four times a year it's brought into the wonderful um, Catholicon, the main church of the monastery. 
my all-night vigils there at this monastery would just so lift an indelible mark on me because they so skillfully unite all the different arts together in one single hymn of praise. So sort of just above there is a massive, it's called a chorus. It's, it's like a, a big crown, probably from that wall to about here. No, much bigger, actually, but that big. And that's supported by 12 chains. And in the middle is a big chandelier on a single chain. And at high points in the service, particularly lords, praise them sun and moon, praise them all your stars and light. We would light all the candles and swing. So the, the, the corona, which was supported by vertical chains, went backs and forwards. But the single chandelier in the middle with, with one chain, that went in a circle. So it's like the planets, the stars, are moving differently. So while you're singing, praise him, sun and moon, praise him, all your stars, and light, they are praising him. So this wonderful um, liturgical drama, if you could call it, used matter to praise God. Um, transfiguration. So Christ's transfiguration on Mount Tabor, I think, is the most graphic visual expression of what St. Maximus the Confessor calls the recapitulation of all things in Christ. Um, we're created to give thanks to God, um, but we live in a consumer society where instead of receiving the material world and giving thanks for it, because we've rejected God as a secular culture, as I said, we're still hungry, we're thirsty, so instead of eating and drinking God, we start consuming more and more things. Yeah, it's a sort of a false liturgy, a false Eucharist. But these things, because we don't give thanks for them, are actually dead. And our saint, um, if um, the Syrian, I believe it was, said that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was actually the created world, which if received with thanksgiving, becomes the tree of life, becomes the tree of good. If it's just grabbed without thanksgiving, it becomes the tree of evil and um, death. So let's look at the transfiguration, where Christ shows that he's undone this, this uh, sin of consumerism, the sin of um, ingratitude, which has left the material creation dead, basically. So Christ is transfigured upon Mount da- Tabor. But interestingly, not only does the scripture say, was Christ transfigured, his face shone with light, it says, but also were his garments transfigured, his garments shone with his uncreated light, this divine glory. I would say that his garments represent the whole cosmos, because cosmos in Greek means adornment. So let's just say Christ's adornment, his clothing, were transfigured. But cosmos is also the Greek word for what we now call nature, the whole created world. So Christ's whole life is gathering the garment of dead, the dead world cast off by us, um, and he gathers it together, wraps it around himself, and transfigures it, returns it to its former glory. He makes it, as it were, um, like a burning bush ag- again. One of the um, hymns for transfiguration says that in his own person, Christ showed them the true nature of man, arrayed in the original beauty of the image. You are transfigured, O Christ, and you have made the nature that had grown dark in Adam to shine again as lightning transforming it into the glory and splendor of your own divinity. So metaphorically, we can say that every liturgy is a Mount Tabor where the transfiguration occurred. The rituals, architecture, and furnishings of authentic worship are like Christ's garment, tailored to shape his body. Our worship should reflect heavenly worship, so it's tailored to reproduce heavenly worship. So as people are transfigured through the Eucharist, so too is the material cloth of the liturgical art transfigured. St. Paul writes in Romans um, 8, the creation itself will be set free from its enslavement to decay when we humans are glorified. And the creation itself will obtain the freedom and glory of the children of God. So the whole creation is waiting for us to join ourselves to God because then it too will shine with light. So I'm going to finish, and I'll just rush through these. How then shall we live? All this is nice theory, but what do we do about it? I would suggest that, first of all, and just about everyone I meet here seems to have founded a foundation of education. (laughs) It's incredible. That's why I love you Americans. In England, we would discuss it. We'd think, oh, we'd grumble about education, and we'd go on television, go and read, and grumble about the government hasn't done anything, and... Try another government, vote this one up, try again. But you in America, you say, there's a need. Let's do something about it. 
You start a foundation, you start schools, and you do it quickly. You know, you start one school, within 20 years, you've got 40 schools. <laughs> so what we do in England, we have committees, very serious committees. We run them very properly with minutes, and about 5,000 of those. And then we think, right, we've got to raise money. Let's start selling jam <laughs> and honey. <laughs> so it takes a bit of time, and inflation is going up. So we end up, this is too difficult, let's not do it. I just love being in America. <laughs> okay. So we're not entirely useless in England. So I'm going to outline three quickly things that, that I've been involved in. So first of all, we need to educate. You all know this. Thirdly, we need to train the liturgical artists. So education. Um, here are some education institutions, Scala, Institute of Sacred Arts, uh, not far from here, St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary. So I'm giving some talks there next week. They've founded an Institute of Sacred Arts. And in England, I've uh, got the Orthodox Institute for Christian Studies. And then um, my wonderful friend here uh, has um, started the Orthodox Arts Journal with some others. Father Justin is here as well. And that's an online journal. So education. Um, it's no use having all the best liturgical artists in the world if they're not commissioned. So you've got to educate priests and leaders to show them the importance of divine beauty. Um, often it's difficult to educate older priests because they sit in their ways. So I'm concentrating on um, seminaries to train the next generation. Secondly, we need um, centres of liturgical art to train makers. So I've started um, three types. One is, first of all, apprentices. This is Martin, a Roman Catholic, who was my apprentice for about... Um, 10 years. And then Jim there, he's an Anglican. Um, he's been an uh, apprentice to me for about seven years. So I'd say that um, apprenticeship is the best form. Um, and then you've got uh, full or part-time schools. So this is a full-time school in uh, Moscow. It's a five-year full-time course. Uh, connected to university, so the theology, but five years also of hard work learning how to paint icons. Um, but most people haven't got time or the money to go full time, so you can have part time schools. So, working with King Charles, Prince Wales as he was, I started a, a part time three year course. So, seven times a year we gather for three intense days, um, and then I give them homework, which is five to ten hours a week. So that was a foundation course. It's hard work. And sometimes people come from America to England to study this. I've got an American um, at the moment studying with me. We get people from Europe as well. And that's actually a pretty good system because people can carry on with their family life and their, their work um, and, and, um, and do this training. So I set pretty high standards. I, I try to scare the wits out of them in the interview, you know, to, to sort of weed out those who just want to dabble. And... Um, yeah. And then we can have slightly more loose arrangements. So um, my two apprentices, um, Martin and Jim, I've sent down to Chichester Cathedral. Um, they approached me two years ago asking if I could help them set up a liturgical art workshop. So we have two elements to that. One is to train people. So they are carrying on doing their own commissions, but then they will take on apprentices for particular tasks. So this massive cross here needs a jessery. So he um, interviewed 10 people, I think, who applied and chose one to learn the art of Jesse. And then Jim is teaching another the art of gilding. Uh, eventually, probably full-time apprentices will come. So that's something a bit more flexible. And it's self-funding, more or less. Um, so training not just makers, but also the commissioners. It's interesting that in Greek, in Byzantine Greece, the term ktitores, maker, referred not to people who made the things physically, but to the commissioners. The commissioner of a church, or the commissioner of the mosaics, was the maker. So in this, you inspire priests and bishops, etc., or presidents of schools to commission beautiful, divine things that won't happen. So I'll finish off with this wonderful quote from... Um, the book of Hebrews. You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You've come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. 
you have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. So Jesus is at the end. In other words, we can't just have me and my life, sweet Jesus. To get to Jesus, you've got to come to the whole family, warts and all. And in this, our whole culture is working toward this new Jerusalem. Then without vision, we, we're going to perish. So liturgical artist is essential to keep before us this heavenly Jerusalem to which we all are hopefully journeying. Thank you. Okay, can you... Yes, I can tell you can hear me. Um, okay, I'll quickly get into it, Aidan. Um, the thing that struck me when you s spoke um, is, first of all, that um, if I'm going to be a, a co-creator, as Margarita <laughs> described it, um, and contribute to the culture and come out on that r the river of Ezekiel and give to, the, to mankind, that the first thing I must do is change myself. And so... Um, I need to learn how to worship and worship well and to engage with all of these um, artifacts that you described. Um, the, the second thing is that uh, that's easier said than done. How, how do we learn to worship? Uh, where do we go to do that? So there is a need for what in the Catholic Church we call mystagogical catechesis, which is really instruction on worship and how to participate well. Um, and it's lacking a great deal. But there is a place where we can do that um, and we needn't be reliant on others and that's in the home. And so um, praying the Psalms at home in the, with the domestic church can be a starting place. Um, what I would like to do just uh, for a few minutes is, is uh, we've got a lot of artists here and a lot of teachers. Um, could you just describe a little bit more um, your philosophy of, of teaching? Um, I will just say um, one thing in my experience as a student of yours, um, and that is that, in a sense, you uh, work to do yourself out of a job. So um, you, you not only taught us pretty much everything that I heard you say today, I, I've heard you speak of in one form or another, just in the context of a class. But also, you explain to us why you're teaching us what you're teaching to enable us to teach ourselves afterwards. Uh, would you just talk a little bit about that and where you, how you developed this method, where you got it from? Because you're self-taught, as, as I understand. Yes, I, I don't like the term self-taught, but I, I must confess I'm self-taught. But Probably a more um, accurate description is that I had to organise my own teaching, so I had to learn to analyse masterpieces and get below the surface of them. So I try to think, well, what layer went first, what went after that, but like an archaeological dig. So because that's how I've learned, um, that's how I teach, I suppose. So we start normally with copying, but not copying mindlessly. Copying is as an excuse, a discipline, to try to understand the... Um, the mysteries, the secrets, the, the techniques, the mindset of those great masters, um, understanding form, etc., etc. So, as you quite rightly say, my, my aim is to make myself redundant, to teach them how to look, basically, how to look. Um, even if someone's come from a highly naturalistic uh, background of painting, sometimes I've found when they come to icons, it's shown that they haven't really looked. So I've got to start all over again. You know, they've got to um, understand form better. So really it's, it's quite analytical. I mean painting icons is a mystical thing but it's incredibly scientific and analytical. You, you, you've really mm -hmm. got to not ask <clears throat> what is done but why and how. Yes. How, how that effect has been achieved. Mm -hmm. Musicians will know this. You know, the, we, we hear the, the fruit of beautiful chanting but someone with consummate skill has known how to craft notes to have that effect on our soul. Right. Um, the other thing that will have been obvious to anyone who was at the session yesterday or saw us is that another thing that everyone has to do is get a, a fine pair of English red trousers. I'm glad you can be. twins, yes. I thought I'd be this to be a bit. But he wears it. So I've changed today. He tells me that it's an English thing. Okay. 
Well, I want to hand over to Paul. Why don't you explain what you do, the marvelous work you do, and then engage with Amy. Sure, and I have to say, yesterday I noticed the red trousers, and I was wearing American jeans, and I felt distinctly out of place. Um, <clears throat> not nearly as fashionable. Um, so, uh, I'm probably the least known of the three of us up here among this crowd. My name is Paul Coyer. I was here last year, so I met many of you. I'm a senior fellow at something called the Common Sense Society based in Washington, D.C. As Margarita mentioned, we prize beauty and civic virtue, among other things, are the, champ uh, the, the values that we champion. Uh, we do that around the world, not just here in the United States. Um, I was raised evangelical, uh, in, in a, I'm going to touch on the arts right away here, but my father and his whole family, despite being fundamentalist Baptists, were all artists. So for those of you that are from a Protestant background that may feel somehow inferior in arts and aesthetics, don't. Uh, and we'll talk about that. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, and I should actually also mention when David and Aiden and I were yesterday in David's um, studio, and we were looking at David's icons that he's painting, I, I pointed out that, uh, that they need to watch behind their back because when I was eight, I entered an international art contest for watercolors and got fourth place. <clears throat> and then I peaked. Um, <laughs> um, I haven't told Donnie that yet. But uh, um, so, uh, yeah, look out, guys. Um, uh, but seriously, about uh, that, that relationship between faith and aesthetics and the arts and beauty obviously is so critical. That's why we're all here. Um, I was, as I mentioned, raised evangelical, but part of the reason why I moved to Anglicanism slash Episcopalianism in my 20s was that, uh, that more, um, more uh, uh, overt emphasis on aesthetics and beauty and the arts that really appealed to me. Um, I think if we want to move beyond our, our tribe, however, whether that tribe is orthodoxy, Catholicism, Protestantism, whatever, we need to actually be able to communicate those values beyond that. And speaking as someone who's raised evangelical, it's easy for us in the evangelical community to speak, you know, Christians speak, right? And Catholics have that, Orthodox have a certain language within their tribes. So we need to learn to move beyond that, especially if we're going to impact a culture that is increasingly uh, religiously diverse as ours is in the 21st century here in the United States. Um, Many mainline churches have an emphasis on liturgy, beauty, and aesthetics as part of their worship culture. My own does. I come from a church in, in uh, the edge of the Shenandoah Valley, sort of called Trinity Episcopal Church in Upperville, Virginia. It's a little town no one's ever heard of, but it's a beautiful, idyllic spot. And um, my wife and I are both involved in the music program there. We're quickly making that a center for music culture in Northern Virginia. And uh, we also have beautiful stained glass windows that depict New Testament on one side, Old Testament on the other. Um, we have uh, carvings of Anglican church giants around the pulpit and in stained glass windows over the choir lofts. And at the end of the pews, we have carvings of flora and fauna. Each pew is different uh, that are native to Virginia, which is quite neat and a link to God's creation, which we see is important as well. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to touch briefly, if I could, on that historical relationship between Protestantism and aesthetics and beauty, because I think uh, probably a third of the crowd here, I would guess, are probably from a Protestant background. And again, I don't want you to feel inferior, because there's, there's good reason for you not to. Uh, some of the most well-known artists in the Western world have been Protestants. The Dutch masters, of course, were almost all Dutch reformed. Uh, in the world of literature, you had Edmund Spencer, one of the premier poets of, uh, of nascent modern English. Uh, we have uh, John Milton, John Bunyan, Robert Louis Stevenson, and closer to our own date, uh, C.S. Lewis, whose house I lived in as a C.S. Lewis scholar in Oxford. Um, on the musical side, we have, of course, Bach, Handel, and Mendelssohn, who are all devout Lutherans. Um, one professor from Grove City College has written, one might even argue that the Protestant aesthetic broadened the arts by including nature, paintings, portraits of fairly ordinary people, scenes from everyday life, uh, etc., and by secularizing art, he argues, Protestantism actually may have broadened, not lessened the artist's scope, and invited the artist to see the beauty beyond the explicitly or narrowly, as he defines it, religious arena. Um, and I think this may be part of the answer is how sacred art in particular can positively shape uh, an increasingly secular society within which we live. Um, <clears throat> In terms of theology of beauty among Protestants, I just want to point out really quickly, some of you may know this, but many of you don't. I've talked uh, yesterday to a couple of you about this. Jonathan Edwards. Uh, what do you think of first when you think of Jonathan Edwards? Exactly. You think of Turner, Burn, Fire, and Brimstone. Um, 
Jonathan Edwards, probably the most central aspect of his uh, theology, however, was an emphasis on beauty. And almost nobody realizes that. Um, a historian of theological aesthetics, Patrick Sherry, who is from Lancaster University, which Aidan touched on earlier, has written that he believes beauty was more central to Edwards' theology than it was to anyone else in Christian history, and that's a big claim. He includes Augustine and the 20th century Catholic theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar. Um, Edwards believed that the world was full of beauty and that reflects its creator and that it was actually Christ's beauty that draws us to him. So uh, I want to touch briefly on music. My wife sent me uh, something last night that, that really touched me. She said, um, it, was, it was a quote that said, philosophers teach us how to think, but composers teach us how to love. Music touches the soul in a unique way and, and in so doing, it clearly does the work of God. So. Uh, I would posit that uh, awakening sensibilities through music, through iconography, through sacred art, um, it, can, uh, it can really open the door to the wooing of God's spirit, even in a culture as secular as ours and as religiously diverse as ours. Um, one of the things my wife and I do is we bring the, the sacred out into the secular world through a project she thought of where she performs pieces inspired by the scriptures and then discusses the musicology, her doctorate is in music, and then I discuss the theology and history. We give a lecture slash recital right here in Princeton hosted by Marguerite and David in January. Um, and the project isn't just aimed at Christians or Jews or Muslims or people of faith as a whole for that matter. It's aimed at the larger culture, which is precisely the reason my wife conceived of it. We don't want to just perform in churches or synagogues or what have you, but in, in uh, you know, broader spaces. So, one of the reasons why this impacts a broader culture, this, one of the quotes that I use when we talk about Bach, uh, a Swarthmore College professor just wrote a biography of Bach where he said that I'm an agnostic, but around Bach, I'm never a very comfortable agnostic. <laughs> and I think that proves the larger point that, that we have, um, that those things open the door to, to God's wooing and to awareness of higher, of higher uh, truths spiritually. So I'd like to turn now to Aiden and tease out some issues that I think have some importance for 23rd first century America related to the human person and understanding of the self. We're facing uh, some cultural shifts today that we haven't, I don't think, ever in human history in how we understand the self, how we define ourselves, how we understand our humanness. Um, for those of you that have heard of Carl Truman, he, uh, he wrote a book called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. I had dinner with him in D.C. a couple of nights ago, on Wednesday evening. Uh, he traces the, the roots of the cultural shifts we now face through about 500 years of history, of intellectual history and, and ideas that have taken root. Um, and so, Aidan, I wanted to ask you what you thought iconography, sacred art as a whole, and even more broadly than that, beauty, what, can, what role can that play in helping us to understand ourselves in relation to God and what it means to be human? In, the, in Greek, the word, um, is this on? Can you hear? No. Yeah. Um, the Greek word for face is the same as person. So my face exists, my person therefore exists, to see you, to hear you, um, and my lips to express myself. So ironically, to be a full human person is to forget oneself and be aware of the other. Immediately I put a mirror up and look at myself, I can't talk to you at the same time. So um, this obsession with, with oneself is actually uh, making it impossible to discover oneself. A second, having said that, You've got to be true to yourself. One of the biggest changes in my own life occurred, I was a teacher at the time, and I loved teaching adults, but I just discovered I wasn't a particularly good teacher of a mob of teenagers. Um, but one day I lay down in bed and I thought, well, what would you really like to do, Aidan? Forgetting all perceived or real difficulties, I thought, to be an artist, that's what I'd love to do. So then I began to reconfigure my whole life. I left teaching and started sculpting as a Christian. And that was a transformative experience for me because before that time, perhaps in my Baptist background, I'd thought of God as like an employer and he paid me well if I saved lots of souls that day. Um, uh, but here, I realized that God wants Aidan to be Aidan and that's the best way for Aidan to love people and for God to love people through me. So it's not the sort of the modern psychological idea of fighting yourself. Uh, the God who created me with a particular character, and I had to be true to that and authentic to that. 
So it's a sort of one sees it opposite of the other, but it isn't. To forget yourself, to serve others, you find yourself, but also be genuine, be authentic. And in iconography, we might start copying to understand secrets of them, but the long term is to find an iconography that's indigenous to Britain or America and unique to that particular approach for that particular church. So that's the uniqueness of it. But one serving something that's eternal. That's terrific. We're going to have to stop. I'm just going to finish with one minute, Marguerite, because I need to... First of all, I want to say what a wonderful evening it was when you, uh, we had Marjorie playing the violin and we prayed Evensong, and it, the whole evening just placed high culture, uh, it, it juxtaposed it with, with its true source, which is the worship of God. There, there is no high and noble and accessible culture unless it is nourished by prayer, which is this river of Ezekiel, really connecting everything. And then one quick story is that something like 30 years ago, um, I'd, I converted to Christianity. I'd met Aidan um, a couple of years before, and I decided I wanted to be an artist. And I phoned you up. You'd just moved into the Hermitage. You'd sent a circular letter around having finished your apprenticeship at Mount Athos, if I can put it that way, and you're in Shropshire. And I phoned you up and said, I want to be an artist. I'm fed up with all of this. Uh, and he said, well, what do you really want to do? And I said, I want to paint the Sistine Chapel. I want to, I want to really bring ca culture of God to the people. And he said, yeah, this sounds good. Um, I'm... I'm frescoing the chapel at the moment. Why don't you come and stay with me for a week? And so that photograph you, you saw, some of those folds of cloth on the wall were painted by me. They probably the, the best ones have I heard. <laughs> <laughs> the tutelage of my teacher. So thank you very much indeed.